Welcome, my dear viewers, thank you for being with my channel and watching my videos, I'm telling you a story from my life, watch this video to the end, you will understand what I'm telling you, so as not to miss my new videos. Do not forget to subscribe to the channel and leave your explanations in the comments then let's go. Yesterday you overheard our conversation didn't you? My eldest son and his wife are returning home for the birth of their child. Consequently, I need you to clear your belongings out to the yard. Excuse me, but you can't have kids anyway, and you don't contribute to my son's work. The least you could do is make some room, especially since I'm paying $10,000 in rent. This situation is becoming too tiresome to deal with. I'm currently living with my mother-in-law, but she now wants me out of the house because my brother-in-law and his wife are returning. With my mother-in-law, brother-in-law, his wife, and my husband, this house is full of problems. I've been trying to maintain a smooth household, but it's becoming a hassle to think about it all. I'm done thinking. Okay, I'll leave, but I can't just put my belongings in the yard, so I'll come back later to pick them up. You're leaving? Thank you. That's a big help. Ignoring my pleas, my mother-in-law, I started packing my things and left the house. Seven seconds after stepping out the door, I took out my phone and called a junk removal service. Once I stopped thinking, no one could stop my actions. I'm Linda, a 40-year-old at Consultant. My husband, Mark, also 40, runs three restaurants as a sole proprietor. Although people often assume we've been married for a long time with kids, we're actually newlyweds. We both lived as workaholics and only married at this age. I had given up on marriage just before turning 40, but a random visit to a bar after work changed my mind. Is this your first time here? Mark asked with a smile as I sat at the end of the bar. I had been curious about the place for a while, and this time I decided to go in as a reward to myself for working hard. Mark assured me that many women come alone, and I felt comfortable as a loner at the counter. I became a regular, always sitting at the end of the bar, and it became normal for Mark to chat with me while I ate. I'm always busy with work, and I can't talk much. How about we go out for dinner sometime? Excited about the chance to dine with a restaurateur, I eagerly agreed. Our conversation slowly drew me to Mark's dedication to his work, and he grew fond of me seeing that I was a hardworking person. We started dating, and two years later, as we both turned 40, we decided to get married. Feeling shy about being a bride at 40, I asked my husband to skip the wedding ceremony, and we just took some photos of us dressed up. After getting married, I moved from my apartment to my husband's three-story house with a garden and parking in a high-end area where the rent is around $1,000. Living with my 70-year-old mother-in-law seemed necessary, given the circumstances. I immediately agreed, but after moving in with my mother-in-law, I regretted accepting so quickly. When I settled into my husband's house, I realized it was too big for just the two of us. In addition to our bedroom, I had a lavish office room for myself, and there were many spare rooms. Curious, I asked my husband a simple question. Why do we need such a big house just for you and your mother? My husband explained that he has a brother three years older than him who left home after college, and they've lost touch. He hasn't been home for a few years, and my husband anticipates that one day he might return, which prompted them to rent a bigger house. I expressed my opinion that it might be a little too big. Well, I got married and you came, so I guess it all worked out, my husband said with a smile as he unpacked my books and arranged them on the shelf. He shared stories about his brother Daniel, who seemed to be hopping from job to job. Despite his brother's situation, my husband didn't harbor negative feelings towards him. Don't talk about that kid. What if he really comes back? My mother-in-law appeared at the doorway of what would be my office, seemingly checking on us. It was clear she didn't have a good opinion of him, unlike my husband. I worried that conflicts might arise between my husband and mother-in-law regarding his brother someday. I'm not too fond of you either, mom. Come on, we're going to live together now, so stop saying things like that, I said. My mother-in-law walked away and my husband apologized, 
assuring me he would talk to her. I told him it's okay. I had a similar talk when we met for the wedding. I'll build a relationship with your mother as we live together, I assured him, taking a book from his paused hands and placing it on the shelf. It seems she didn't like my age. Being 40 makes it challenging to have children, and my mother-in-law probably wished Mark had married someone younger. Once the move was complete and our married life officially began, my mother-in-law's coldness towards me became evident. While there was no harassment or physical violence, she ignored or avoided me as much as possible. It felt a bit lonely, but I decided to consider it okay for now and hope to build a relationship with her over time. More pressing was my concern for Mark. Are you okay with your work? I asked him. No, it's pretty bad. I need to take action soon, but it's tough to arrange the finances, Mark replied, sitting at the dining table with his head in his hands. I abandoned the dishes and settled in front of him, eager to listen. These are tough times. Mark began, his voice heavy with concern. Prices are soaring, expenses climbing, and customers are tightening their wallets. There's no end in sight. If this keeps up, I might have to close another one of our stores. About a year into our marriage, the situation at Mark's restaurants worsened. One of the three stores had already closed, and it seemed another might follow suit. Seeing Mark's troubled face weighed heavily on me, but my mother-in-law appeared unfazed by these challenges. You're Mark's wife, but you don't help out at the store. You just do your own job. Can you really say you're fulfilling your role as a wife? My mother-in-law's voice cut through the air from the living room, having overheard our conversation. I wondered what she was thinking, but she had her own perspective. Mark has been running his own restaurant for nearly 10 years, overcoming various challenges. I believe he'll pull through this time too. You, his wife, shouldn't be making that face. Are you trying to feed into his anxiety and make him fail? What a terrible wife, she shouted again, her words dripping with spite and venom. I knew she wasn't simply trying to provoke me, but there was some truth in her words. Taking her words positively, I resolved to support Mark to the fullest, smiling reassuringly at my anxious husband. A year later, just as she said, Mark managed to turn the situation around and avoided closing a second store. See, I told you, I said to my mother-in-law, a stupid wife who can't even trust her husband. Don't drag Mark down, she replied, lashing out at me without reservation. Though our relationship seemed strained, since Mark's business was doing well, I considered it a break-even situation. However, things took a turn for the worse. Mark, having stabilized the business and with some extra money, seemed to get carried away, and rumors of his affairs surfaced. I couldn't fathom what he was thinking. Surely there were better ways to spend the money. It's peculiar how bad situations tend to pile up. Having witnessed Mark's business revenue drop, I understood this all too well, but I never imagined it would happen to me. Then Daniel called my brother. Yes, Daniel, a freelancer and his pregnant girlfriend who worked at the same bar as Mark. They asked if they could move into our house and if they could work at Mark's restaurant. As I pondered how to address Mark about the affair from the dining room, my mother-in-law entered the living room and engaged him in conversation. They discussed Daniel, whom I had never met, and I felt completely sidelined as they continued their discussion. It was a peculiar scene. My mother-in-law, who used to resent Daniel for not fulfilling his role as the eldest son, was now urging Mark to welcome him. The reason was straightforward. The prospect of a grandchild. She had previously given up hope of seeing one but now perceived an opportunity and had a change of heart. She even planned to offer them a home and jobs. Mark, who had always been supportive of Daniel, had rented this large house for such an occasion. However, circumstances had shifted and I found myself caught in the middle. It struck me as odd to have Daniel and his family move in. I glanced at Mark from the dining area and he returned my gaze with a troubled expression. Come on, it's a good thing. Daniel is in trouble, and you, Mark, have the means to help him, my mother-in-law said, pressing him. Mark seemed unable to refuse his mother's request, and I couldn't help but feel disappointed. I had hoped he would stand up to her. 
but it seemed like wishful thinking. He kept glancing at me, likely concerned about my reaction. With the deteriorating relationship with my mother-in-law, Mark's affair, and now the prospect of living with Daniel and his family, the problems were mounting. Overwhelmed and unsure where to begin, I decided to abandon my thoughts for the day and simply go to sleep. The next day, a holiday and likely due to extreme mental fatigue, I slept in until late morning. Mark was at work, leaving just my mother-in-law and me at home. As I reluctantly made my way to the living room, I dreaded what she might say about my late awakening. You sure slept in. Must be nice to have such leisure, she remarked, surpassing my expectations. She then informed me about Daniel and his wife's impending visit for maternity leave. So move your stuff out to the yard. Excuse me? I questioned, still groggy from sleep. She clarified that I should vacate to make room for Daniel and his family, citing my inability to have children and lack of contribution to Mark's work. I was taken aback. It seems she was indeed asking me to leave the house. Realizing that my presence was now deemed unnecessary, I decided it was too much trouble to fret over Mark, my mother-in-law, Daniel's family, and our future. Understood, I'll leave, I declared. I can't put all my belongings in the yard, so I'll come back later to pick them up. Ignoring my words, my mother-in-law expressed gratitude, and I began packing my things, leaving the house seven seconds after stepping out the door. I grabbed my phone and dialed a junk removal service, my decision firm and resolute after putting an end to my overthinking. No one could sway me now. Let them all come to regret this choice later. Departing from the house, I opted to stay at a hotel temporarily. Although I had arranged for the removal service, they required some time to prepare. This aligned perfectly with my desire for some time alone. Two weeks after leaving, I secured an apartment and began living independently. Since then, I hadn't heard from Mark, who probably believed I'd eventually return. The idea of Mark taking the current situation lightly infuriated me. However, today marked the day after his restaurant's day off, and I anticipated a call from Mark when he visited the restaurant for lunch prep. What's going on here? The restaurant is completely empty. Mark exclaimed over the phone, confirming my expectations. Just as I thought, I chuckled and replied, Mark, I could explain over the phone, but it would be more efficient if your mom was there too. I'm heading to the house now. Can you come back? You can open the restaurant anyway, right? Unable to contain my laughter, I hung up, amused by Mark's reaction. He must be quite shocked. Still chuckling. I began preparing to leave. Upon arriving at the house, my mother-in-law immediately started yelling at me. Mark had apparently explained part of the situation. An unfamiliar couple, Daniel and his wife, were in the living room, looking confused and anxious, not fully grasping the situation amid my mother-in-law's extreme anger. Why would you do such a thing? The restaurant can't operate now, she continued to scold. I countered, stating that it was my restaurant, and there shouldn't be a problem with me starting the closing process or having the items I bought disposed of by a junk removal service. Huh, your restaurant? What are you talking about? Why don't you explain, Mark? You haven't told your mom, have you? I challenged. Mark hesitated but confessed, admitting that I had paid for the expenses to turn around his struggling second restaurant branch. Hearing this, my mother-in-law looked perplexed trying hard to understand but lacking the full information. Mark continued, uncomfortable and holding back, so I decided to step in and clarify. Before turning 40, I was single and working in at consulting, with no wedding ceremony or new house purchase after marriage. I had saved up a significant amount of money. I lent Mark $200,000 to help revitalize his second restaurant branch, subsequently buying the rights to become its owner. I explained that I left most of the management to Mark, shifting his focus from the main branch to the second for its recovery. When Mark's restaurant was in crisis, I showed my concern alongside him. It was during a moment when my mother-in-law criticized me for not showing enough trust in my husband that I decided to support Mark to the fullest. My form of support was providing him with the necessary funds. 
During my single years, I had diligently saved money. Mark, is this true? My mother-in-law asked incredulously. Yes, it's true, Mark admitted. She seemed surprisingly okay with it, even if I failed and squandered the $200,000 she had given me. Given the sizable amount, she suggested that it, if it was destined to fail anyway, it might be simpler for me to become the owner. The plan was to repay the borrowed $200,000 from the restaurant's earnings, but it was more straightforward for me to become the owner, with the restaurant's income going directly to me. Additionally, it afforded me the authority to decide whether to keep the restaurant open or not. It's a lie. Can something like that really happen? My mother-in-law exclaimed. To provide evidence, I spread documents like the business license transfer, rights agreement, and lease agreement on the table, proving my ownership of the restaurant. As she confirmed my name on those documents, her face turned red with shock. Why didn't you say anything about this? You always talked about how you believed in Mark and how the restaurant was recovering, right? She demanded. Mark explained that he felt pressured by her words, always striving to live up to her expectations. He didn't want to disappoint her, so he couldn't bring himself to reveal that he had borrowed a large sum of money from me. He feared her reaction, knowing how easily upset she could be. People like my mother-in-law often don't realize the pressure they put on others, and Mark found it challenging to express himself under her constant scrutiny. It was crucial not to let Mark's spirit break under her constant jabs, especially when the restaurant was finally turning around. That's why I kept quiet too. Mark and my mother-in-law apologized, and it seemed like everything was being resolved amicably. However, it was far from satisfactory for me, and the discussion was far from over. I handed Mark a divorce paper, shocking him. He assumed it was a reconciliation, but I knew about his affair with a part-timer, and the other part-time workers were aware of it too. Mark was taken aback, claiming it was just a rumor, but I presented evidence, a photo sent by a part-time worker showing Mark entering a hotel. While anyone could fabricate such evidence, it was undeniable. The success of the second branch had given him too much confidence, and he had gotten carried away. The resolution wasn't as simple as reconciliation. It required deeper discussions and decisions to be made. I reflected on my role as the restaurant owner, acknowledging that while I couldn't handle day-to-day -day operations, I made occasional visits to stay connected. The part-time workers, having learned about Mark's affair, sought my assistance. With their unwavering support, they provided evidence and kept the impending closure of the restaurant from Mark. My mother-in-law's voice quivered as she confronted the reality of closing the second branch and the impending divorce. The revelation that I had been paying the entire $10,000 monthly rent added another layer of shock. Mark, now burdened with the weight of financial difficulties, faced an uncertain future. As the discussion progressed, Daniel and his wife realized the challenges they would encounter in continuing to live in the house. Daniel pleaded for help, citing their impending parenthood, but the escalating argument underscored the uncertainty surrounding everyone's future. After the divorce, I focused on closing the restaurant, selling equipment to offset expenses. The experience as a restaurant owner proved insightful, reinforcing my commitment to my AI consulting career. With the family dynamics strained, the fallout extended to Mark and his mother, now sharing a small apartment with strained communication. The resolution brought both closure and uncertainty. The exposure of Mark's affair and the revelation of true ownership exposed familial fractures. The decision to close the restaurant added financial stress, and the introduction of divorce papers signaled a decisive move by me to take control of my life. The aftermath left strained relationships, financial uncertainty, and an uncertain future for everyone involved. The emotional toll of the conflicts was palpable, and the story closes with a sense of closure for some aspects but leaves lingering questions about the characters' futures and their ability to rebuild after the storm. The resolution, while providing clarity, marks the beginning of a new chapter as each character navigates the consequences of their choices.